Well, praise the Lord in Jesus' holy and blessed name. What a beautiful day it is to be in Jesus. So amen, amen. Well, Brother Thomas with you here, and this is a ministry of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, folks out there, we begin today where we left off our last time together. And it is in the first epistle general of Peter. And we are in chapter one. And today we're going to pick up verse 13. The last time we were together and on the last DVD that was produced, we dealt with the greeting and the A, B, C, and D of salvation. And now the other side is sanctification. And we've brought this subject up a number of times as we have prepared to get to this section and to begin to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> what it is to be sanctified. There is a lot of confusion, really doesn't need to be. Uh, but before we actually get started, someone has asked me, what am I reading from? And I answer this question in basically all of the commentaries, and that is from my, um, um, my handwritten Bible study notes. That's what these are. It's not somebody's book or, you know, it's my handwritten Bible study notes that we are recording onto the DVD for you. And someone asked me, well, if that's the case, don't you know the material? You have to read it. And <laughs> oh, I know it. I wrote it. Okay. Uh, the issue is that Tom loves to digress. And so if we're not careful and I don't stick to the script, we could be here for days, weeks, and hours because I'll go off in 400 different directions. So, <laughs> so we stick to the script. I stick to the script because the, the notes are the concise, stay on point, stay focused uh, <clears throat> pieces of the puzzle. And so that is why. And so it's a glory. This is First Peter that we're working in right here. I have it right here. Uh, and we use them for all of the commentaries. They are just my handwritten Bible study notes that were made during the Bible studies that we're recording for you. Amen? Amen. So that's what it's about. So now <clears throat> we're entering our third major section of the first epistle general of Peter. It is the exhortation to sanctification and it is in chapter one and it runs from verse 13 through verse 25. And the first part is A, the admonition to sanctification. B is the basis for sanctification and C, the results of sanctification. So we'll have an A, B, and C. A, admonition. You know, we quoted this line earlier on. There is an old line that says there is more to salvation than just getting saved. And this is very true. The getting saved is only the beginning of a new life in Christ. Every evangelist and pastor will share that message with you and should indeed. And as we say, we have seen the two distinct roles of evangelist and pastor in the work of Peter's writing here. First, the evangelist in salvation, and now the pastoral in sanctification. The evangelist is needed for the saving of souls, the pastor for one's journey in life. Oh, praise God, praise God. After addressing the glory of salvation, he then gives a blessed exhortation on sanctification in a powerful three-pronged approach. Admonition, basis, and the results of sanctification. Oh, and praise God. Both sides of Peter's ministry, the evangelist and the pastoral, are revealed here. Oh, and praise God for that. For the Lord and the church now clearly established. Peter is now a man most focused, yet still very passionate. There are a number of Bible characters that I would love to hear preach and teach, and I shared this with you a little bit at the end as we were setting you up to come into today, that I would love to hear preach or teach. Jesus, of course, John as a teacher, Paul, because I'd love to put some body language with that, those words, amen. And of course, Peter. Oh, how I would love to hear Peter preach the gospel. 
can't imagine going away without being filled to overflowing with the Holy Ghost who hath been sent down from heaven. Hallelujah. Indeed. Yes, indeed. I say all this to make a point, knowing that we are what we are given to know about Peter. We know that Peter is a man of great passion, intense, and has a tendency to step out and, and say and do things before thinking about them. Well, now at this point in his life, 30 years of spirit-filled ministry and walking in the word and with the spirit of God, uh, God has worked a blessed work in Peter's life. And that may bring him into the work of the spirit, and uh, but he still, from his writings, is clearly a man of great passion. And therefore, it makes it quite difficult to read Peter's epistle in a monotone type of voice. It is not only a preacher's dream come true text, it is also a teacher's dream come true text. There is so much here for teachers like myself to share that it's uh, coming to a focus point in putting these things together is a great blessing, also a great challenge. Oh, and amen and amen, for sure. Ah. So as I say, knowing what we know and are given to know about Peter, to use the word exhortation here, uh, to sanctification is to be understood in its most passionate and emphatic sense. This also is also borne out in the technical sense in verse 13 as we're about to see. And, and keep in mind that verse 13 begins with a the word wherefore. Wherefore. And whenever a sentence begins with a wherefore, we really do want to know what the wherefore is there for. Amen. In this case, it is there for the glory of of salvation, for the glory of salvation. Here is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, grit up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. The main verb in verse 13 is an imperative, hope, with a participle in attendant circumstances. Grid up, gird up. <laughs> a metaphor referring to the custom of tying up one's loose flowing robes in the process of getting ready for work. An equivalent contemporary metaphor might be, let's roll up our sleeves and get ready to work the business of holiness. Here is the technical sense that we mentioned. Peter is not presenting these things as good ideas, just as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is not just good ideas or something we might want to think about experiencing or consider to, to do. You know, quite the contrary. Observe that the main command here is hope which means to assure a confident attitude of expectation toward the grace. Into this one word, grace, Peter has put all of the glorious content of our salvation previously given in verses 3 through 12. This package, he says, is now being brought to us, and we should live with our expectations fixed upon it. The package, grace, is on its way now and will arrive in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh yes, we are born again, a child of God. We've been forgiven. Grace, mercy, we walk in them. But these are but a down payment, the token of what we shall see. That's a glorious appearing at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, and amen. Now, as the born a new child of God, 
of whom Jesus is our elder brother, the firstborn among many, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's First Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Again, the main verb is imperative. Be ye holy. Holiness is the emphatic demand put upon believers. Here, it is to involve all your conduct. Remember, this is about the girding up of your minds. Verse 13, our minds are now being renewed. We no longer conform ourselves to the evil desires of our former ignorance. And you, as we say, can lust in much more than sexual matters. But the root of evil is the same. And we have just used the word evil twice in this same paragraph. What is the opposite of evil? Holy. Holy. Before we knew the gospel, we lived in ignorance, controlled by evil. But now is the knowledge of God made known. God is holy. So you be holy. You must be holy. For God's Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you. The Spirit of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. So recognize, right now, you are holy. You may just now be realizing it, but the fact of the matter is that you are holy. So recognize the holiness of God that is within you and is your new character. And be ye holy. The pagan standards are to be abandoned. The new model is God himself. You can see Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, chapter 41, verse 16, and also verse 20. I have often been asked to explain this in more detail because on the surface, this appears to be radical. To this, I say, it's not radical, it's right. Radical infers to me that the position being taken is extreme in some sense. For instance, being too far left or too far right in politics. In Christ Jesus our Lord, we are not far right or far left. We are not conservative or liberal. We are holy. Holy. All things of the old man and the old woman Die. You are a new creature, a new creature, a new man, a new woman, filled with God's Holy Spirit. And how do we define the word holy? Well, we could, as we have, looked it up in the dictionary, and we find words like moral purity, consecrated. And these are correct. But consider for a moment this truth. God. God is holy. God is holy. Holiness is not just something he has, like a possession, but rather holiness is an attribute of God. It is who God is. God is holy. And so where do we find our example of being holy? Why, God, of course. And in the form of a man? None other than Jesus. Our lives are about living and speaking truth. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father but by Jesus, as we learn in John 14, 6. And how do we know of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Word of God? Well, since words express the thoughts or the thinking reveal the thoughts or thinking of the one who is speaking them. The word of God reveals the thinking of God. And there is no subject we cannot know what God thinks about. And hence, his holiness is revealed. Amen. 
We have been set apart for holy living. It is in God's holiness that we find the basis for our sanctification. We cannot be of the world and of God. The world is unholy. Yes, I said unholy. As opposed to God, who is only and all holy. All right. I know this is hard for some, but you cannot mix pagan standards and God's standards together and succeed. Oh, it may appear to, but it is a house built on sand. So we say, build your house upon a rock, upon the rock. Hallelujah. Build your house upon a rock. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Be ye separate. Hallelujah. Peter's epistle is designed to step us through an understanding of this very call. And it is a call. This is a call to be holy, to be sanctified. Aha! Now here's the catch. This is the clincher right here. You cannot do this yourself. You cannot make yourself be this holy. Only God can. Oh yes, you can invent some form of holiness, but it's just that, a form of holiness. God's holiness is a gift to you from God. It is one of the natural products of a right relationship with God. Holiness comes with being born again. As a child of your heavenly father, you are now your father's child. His character is your character. This is not what could be or what may be or can be someday. It is the reality of right here, right now, today, today. Today, for you, it is true. This is about faith, not works, by the way. This is who we are. And thanks be to Jesus for it. Again, this is about faith, not works. The works will be born out of the faith. Amen now. Faith first. The works are born out of the faith. I did not. <laughs> it's as James says, I do not need to say I have faith. My works reveal my faith. And these works are those that can only come from true faith. Only true faith produces these works, the true works of God. Amen. Believe God right now, right here. See the salvation of God, see the salvation of God, and be sanctified, set apart in the holiness of God. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. Because you are. You are. By virtue of your salvation, you are sanctified. That's where the misconception comes in. Sanctification is the product of salvation. Recognize it if you don't already and realize you are set apart for God's service. Amen now. B, basis for sanctification. A, the admonition, the exhortation. Now B, the basis for it. In verses 17 through 21, 1 Peter chapter 1. <laughs> okay, now we know we are to be sanctified. What is the basis for this sanctification? This is a logical and reasonable question, and one that is worthy of address, and Peter now does so, beginning in verse 17. And if ye call on the Father who is without respect of persons, who... Oh, hallelujah, and judgeth according to every man's work. 
pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. In fear. Ooh, oh. Yes, this one gets a lot of second uh, uh, looks based upon the incorrect understanding of the word fear in this text, but we'll come to that. The clause at the beginning of the verse, and if ye call on the Father, uh, and this translates well as, since you invoke as Father, since the Gentiles had named the name of God, here is something you should know. You have invoked, called on this Father. Know this, he judges everyone according to what they do, and God does so impartially. Did you give your life to Christ? or not? Have you been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ or not? And if yes, are your actions, your words, your deeds, your conduct, do they reflect faith and trust in the God and Father which you now call upon or invoke as Father? And should you call upon the Father who judges accordingly, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Ooh, this is a blessed truth that is often misunderstood due to incorrectly defining the word fear. So this has been given somewhat of a negative connotation when nothing could be further from the truth. The fear in this text is not scared fear, for scared fear has torment. And torment is not what God is about. Not what God is about. For those who call upon his name. This fear is reverent awe of God and respect for God. We have an holy awe with humble respect to an awesome God. A God and Father who loves us and showers us with grace and mercy, as a caring mother nourishes and a loving father instructs. Oh, hallelujah. Please give heed to the focus of the glory here. It is the Father, and in him we are blessed beyond measure. This being the case, what scared fear have we of the judgment of our Father? Ought we not to embrace his truth and righteousness and be clothed in his glory? Pass the time. Does not mean to twiddle our thumbs or sit around and tremble. Once again, the main verb is an imperative and means conduct yourselves in godly reverence. Ooh. Holiness is to pervade every corner of our life. When we name the name of God, we must abandon all to God. Uh, of our sojourning here, our time here is a temporary residence. It's a temporary residence here. We are a truly blessed body of pilgrims in a foreign land. Our citizenship is in heaven not of any kingdom or nation of the world. Oh yes, we respect and do not break the laws of the land in which we sojourn, so long as they are not contrary to the word of God, of course. When God says, come out from among them and be separate, this is a part of being separate or sanctified. Our lives are now filled with the presence of God and are filled with action as we are Christ to the world. This invokes all, 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 hallelujah, all of our being, spirit, soul, and body, spirit, soul, and body. We not only know the truth, but also realize we have truly been set free from the world by truth. Now we freely choose to speak the truth, but conduct ourselves in it as well. And we can do that only because of the presence of God's Spirit within us 
as new, truly born again, Jesus believing Christians by the spirit of God, by the power of God, not by our own works or our own deeds. We cannot do this that way. Can't happen. <coughs> Excuse me I'm about sharing a little drink with me here real quick. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Now we freely choose to speak the truth and conduct ourselves in it. In word and in deed, do all that you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father by him. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19, we read this, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. Here in we find the heart of our basis for sanctification. It is because we know that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, of God, Jesus, that we talk and walk in godly reverence, in reverent awe of God. Hallelujah. The word redeemed refers to the payment of a required price, to release one from an obligation. This is one of the most important words in the, the Bible, since it succinctly describes the atonement of Jesus Christ and the reason for his death upon the cross. Peter refers to the fact that his readers, like all Christians, have been released from an empty and meaningless life by the payment made on their behalf. And the value of that payment is far greater than silver and gold in any amount. All of the silver and gold on earth cannot save one soul as just one drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Lamb of God, the cross, which signifies that glorious work. Oh, and hallelujah. A price paid to release us from traditional pagan conduct of every sort. Of every sort, of every sort, of every sort. And there is so much. The call to lie, live holy lives for our brief sojourn on the earth is blessed indeed. In the interim, as we wait for the consummation of our salvation, it is based upon the great price paid by Jesus Christ. Oh, please stop and consider the ramifications of this in practical terms. Being born again is about much more, much, much more than going to heaven someday. We have a purpose for our time here, no matter how long or short. It is the beginning of an eternal journey with God. Oh, and hallelujah. A question Jesus once asked comes to mind at this point. Is the servant greater than his master? The answer is no. If Jesus faced these things in his life and ministry, why should it surprise us when we experience these same things and we are called to respond in like fashion? That's right, like fashion, in word and in deed. And we do it in the name and by the power and of the same Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And the Father is glorified in the Son and our redemption is sure. And from this we know there really is only one price that could be paid. One price that could be paid. The sinless life of the only begotten of the Father. He who knew no sin took upon himself our sin. Upon himself. And they were paid. Paid for in his life and his blood. 
Note the continuity that Peter assumes between the Old and New Testaments here in the phrase like of a lamb without blemish or spot. This would be one of the first things Peter would learn of Jesus in John chapter 136. As the lamb of God, Jesus is the sacrifice to which all the Old Testament sacrifices point. And the shedding of innocent blood that began in Genesis chapter 3. Now we have our basis for sanctification. Our basis for sanctification becomes more clear. We are bought, bought with a high price. Yes, indeed. Yes, it is. We have been bought with a high price. But we have not been bought into slavery. It is our freedom. It is our freedom that has been paid for. We are no longer under the bondage of sin and death. We have been bought, our freedom paid for. We are free now to choose God, choose rightly. Free, free indeed. Hallelujah. And clearly the basis for these, this sanctification is not in ourselves. It's not in Peter or myself as the, the speaker of this commentary, but Jesus and Jesus only. Sweet Jesus, only sweet Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we read, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. These last times for you. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. The word foreordained is the verb form of the noun in verse 1, in chapter 1 and verse 2, translated foreknowledge. Here in this verse, it refers to the prior determination on the part of the Father to send the Son as the Savior of the world. Although he was predestined before the foundation of the world, Jesus was not made known or manifested until these last times. The last times here translates the idea not of the extension of time according to the schema of the Bible, but to a specific time when something is supposed to happen and it will happen. It will happen just as God has said it would. This is, of course, another reference to the fulfillment of prophecy in Jesus Christ. The believers of Peter's day were the first generation to have these things preached and made known unto them as fulfilled. As profound as this is for those to whom Peter is writing, I cannot help but stop and consider the impact of this truth upon those who were true students of these prophecies. They would no doubt be much like us today as we are at the last generation to hear these things preached before Jesus comes again in the glorious appearing. And yes, brothers and sisters, we do believe that we're not far, that we're not far at all from the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, amen. And it is by him, Jesus, we do believe in God that raised him up from the dead. Lay hold on this power of this truth. The Father raised Jesus, the Son, from the dead. It is the Father glorified in the Son and the Son glorified in the Father. The resurrection is a fact. Jesus is alive. Jesus is a living Lord, a living Savior, now seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the fundamental element of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here is the why. Mm -hmm. That your faith and hope might be in God. Oh, hallelujah. Here is the last piece of the basis for our sanctification. God has done this for us. That our faith and hope are centered and rest in God. This was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. 
If ever we needed a basis for sanctification, we have it now. And what a blessing for those to whom Peter addressed this epistle to. This would be particularly profound for these Gentiles called to come out and be separate. You have been consecrated by the blood of Jesus, made holy as your God is holy. God is our all in all. In him, we find complete fulfillment. This leads Peter to the results of sanctification. They are as blessed as has been the call and the basis for sanctification. <laughs> there is a blessed peace that comes from knowing that the basis is not in our works or anything that we can do. Remember that, recognize that immediately, right now, right here today. Your salvation, hence your sanctification, is not because of something you can do or earn or, or, or do works, forget all that. It is the gift of God to you through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Okay. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay. See, the results of sanctification is found in chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. In this section, Peter sums up a dozen or more teachings of Jesus in just these first in these four verses. And not Jesus only, but these verses parallel the teachings of the Apostle Paul as well as the Apostle John. The harmony of the gospel from Jesus to Paul to Peter to John is blessed and a blessed confirmation of their inspirer, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, hallelujah and amen. In chapter 1, verse 22, we read this. Seeing ye have purified, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Hallelujah. The first blessing is found in the two words, purified and pure in this text. This is about being cleansed or clean. We have cleansed our souls. We have cleansed our souls. Yes, we have. And note the how. But before we consider the how, also note the language, that the language indicates that we have. Not will someday, if you're good, but you have purified your soul. And the how you purified your soul is as important as the fact that you have, present tense, purified your soul. In obeying the truth through the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, Holy Spirit, we obey the truth through the Spirit, amen? Without the Spirit, we could not obey the truth. This is the only possible way because of our new life in Christ. The obeying is not works for salvation. The obeying is possible because of salvation. Remember, our souls have been purified. Obeying the truth is the result of our sanctification, our new life in Christ, being separated. And the word obey here, fascinating word. It's not about following a list of rules or do's or don'ts or, or laws or commandments. The obeying here is the attentive hearkening. That's the meaning of the word, attentive hearkening. Praise God. How do we obey? Pay attention. Amen. Pay attention. Attentive hearkening. Love that word. Hallelujah. The appeal now goes back to the main ingredient of love, mentioned in chapter 1 of verse 8. The main verb in these four verses is love one another. This is the fourth in a series of imperative main verbs, which are all based on the primary description of our glorious salvation in verses 
3 through 12. The call to holiness in verse 13 through 25 then involves hope in verse 13, holiness in verse 15, reverence in verse 17, and now love in verse 22. Love, not bitterness, is the outcome of holiness. When we have truly purified our souls through the Spirit, less, Peter says it will result in unhypocritical brotherly love. We have freely received God's love, so we will freely give it. And we've talked about this before. We've talked about this before. We do not just love them anyway or anyhow. And you hear that old preach, oh, just love them anyway. Just love them anyway. No, that's wrong. We love them. We love them with the unconditional love of God that God has loved us with and loves us <laughs> in. <laughs> Hallelujah. We don't love them anyhow. We love them with sincere affection. That's the right term. With sincere affection. Now, and again we say, this is only possible because of our new life in Christ. There is a certainty of fact about this life in Christ. There really is, brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived by those who would tell you otherwise. In 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Here in verse 23, the living word of God is the instrument used by the spirit of God to impart the principles of the new life. Hebrews 4.12 helps us to understand that. Here is Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow. <laughs> take note, take note that the word of God is threefold. Threefold. <laughs> Quick, powerful, and sharp. Here is one Greek translation of this verse. The word of God speaks, is alive, full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints, and of marrow, that is, of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and shift, sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Wow. A lot of wow going on here today. <laughs> That's a definite wow. Here are the mechanics of how we heard the word of God and received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, or born again, not of corruptible seed as in our first birth. No, no. From the corrupted seed of man, but born of incorruptible seed, Jesus Christ, the promised seed, and praise the Lord, the gospel is preached, and amen. The second half of verse 23 ties directly into verses 24 and 25, and here we go with the second half of verse 23 through verse 25, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Hallelujah. Peter is addressing several points here that are very important. Peter quotes from Isaiah 46, and following in praise of the word of God, which unlike fallen man or any creatures, 
continues its beauty, effectiveness, and life forever. Everything else in the world is like grass. Its beauty is only temporary. The grass dies and its beauty fades. God's word, however, is living and effective forever. Living and effective forever. Another of the results of sanctification is seen here. We will live forever by the word of God and not die. And this is first about present tense as much as it is about future tense, although both are clearly in view. The word of God is alive, is effective, and will forever be. Amen. In chapter 1, Peter has laid the foundation of salvation and to sanctification. We are blessed in our generation to the salvation of hope, power, trial, and revelation. Salvation opens a door to sanctification. This is about the entrance in and the establishment of a new life in Christ. In closing on this section, it is noteworthy that four different expressions for the word are used in the Greek here. Note the synonyms for word, and then in verse 23, the word of God, and then in verse 25, it is the word of the Lord, and then we have the word which is by the gospel is preached unto you. Yes, yes. And today, the gospel is preached unto you. Oh, and amen. And oh, and amen. Praise God. Salvation, sanctification. Salvation, sorry about that. <laughs> Salvation, sanctification. Yes, indeed. Oh, and amen. We are sanctified. Sanctification is not some special work that you have to go through some classrooms for or deeds to earn or things that you must do or some commitment that you have to make special. That's not what sanctification is about at all. Not at all. Sanctification is the natural character, the natural new condition of one who is saved. If you are born again, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, then you are sanctified, set apart for God's service in whatever capacity that he has for you. Oh, it doesn't necessarily mean that now you're going to go out and preach or teach or have to do something like this and put your face on TV and or radio or do any. No, wherever God has called you to be and whatever God has called for you to do, speak, say, write, share, labor upon, you've been called. And you are set apart for his service. So praise God. You are saved. You are sanctified. You are holy. Holy. If Jesus, as our elder brother, is our example of how to live and conduct ourselves, he was sanctified. So are we, as the children of God. We are sanctified and set apart for sure in God's holy service. Oh, amen, amen. All right, well, brothers and sisters, we ran a little bit long today with this section. Ooh, so desired to get this into one piece together. Uh, I think we were pretty bound and determined we were gonna get this whole piece onto one message. <laughs> so thank you for coming and sharing and listening today. Oh, and may God richly bless and keep you. As you continue on now in your journey in the word of God. What a blessed time. What a blessed truth. Quick prayer. God, our heavenly father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together and share your truth in Jesus' holy name. May those who are of the faith be strengthened and those who do not yet know you be convicted and brought to repentance and forgiveness in salvation and sanctification. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Once again, brothers and sisters, thank you 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming and sharing with us today. In Jesus' holy name, amen, amen.